Well, that's, that's my explanation of the difference between animals and people. People do talk about what they're doing. They talk about the world in which they live, the contingencies that affect them, and they try to influence each other by describing contingencies. In other words, by giving reasons rather than by reinforcing. Now, I would say that the behavior modifier has discovered that in many cases the reasons won't do it and that you then work on the contingencies of reinforcement. This would be particularly true of psychotics and retarded people who uh, aren't actually able to respond to reasons. They, the descriptions of contingencies don't get through to them. Neither do contingencies very often. That's why you have to have very conspicuous reinforcers, such as a token economy. That, if that works, it works. And of course, you want to get rid of the, of the conspicuous reinforcers as soon as you, uh, as you can. But this whole difference between contingency shaped behavior and rule governed behavior, which is the rational kind of thing that the, where, the, where you talk about the contingencies and change people because they can learn from the experience of others by following rules, is, is I think essentially the difference between a narrow conception of behavior modification and a narrow conception of what cognitive psychology is all about. I would argue that the cognitive processes are also behavioral and there's no reason to make that, uh, that distinction. Well, that, that was, I think, covers several of the, of the questions that have been raised here. I want, since my charming daughter is here, I want to uh, answer one other question right away. Um, it's called a personal question here, a person with a question mark after the personal. Would you describe in what way your children were involved with the Skinner box? <laughs> that, that means that, uh, that means the uh, means the so-called air crib, not the lever pressing uh, box. Uh, did you use some principles of behavior analysis to raise your children? What was the outcome? <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I welcome this. Uh, uh, question because I like to correct some some rumors that uh, that go around. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure that some of you have heard them. Um, uh, the distinguished psychiatrist, whose name you all know, I won't mention it, uh, told a distinguished person whose name you also would know that the child that we raised in the so-called box, the air crib, became psychotic. I. Uh, wrote to him, I said, we've heard this before, and I've often wondered where it came from. Would you mind telling me where you heard this rumor? My daughter is, uh, our daughter is uh, very intelligent, talented, married. Her husband teaches international studies at the University of Warwick. They live in London in Leamington Spa. My daughter is a very successful artist. She does large colored etchings and sells all she can produce and so on. Uh, I don't see any ill effects of the, uh, of the air crib on her. Well, he wrote a very apologetic letter, I must say that. He didn't tell me where he heard it. Um, <laughs> then uh, one summer, uh, a British critic came over and uh, said to a friend of ours, who and a professor of literature at Harvard, isn't it too bad about that uh, daughter of the Skinners they raised in the box killing herself? <laughs> and uh, our friend said, well, well, when did she do that? I was swimming with her yesterday. <laughs> But recently I've been getting letters, I've had two or three in the last month. Is it true that your daughter is suing you? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, um, I wish to say, um, that's the daughter which is not here, I can't put her on display, but uh, um, she, um, she is not suing me. We have a very good relationship, as a matter of fact. As to using behavior modification, it's very curious, I look back on it now, I never did use any kind of contrived reinforcing contingencies on my children. Nor are there any in Walden II. That's a very curious thing, I think. Walden II was written seven years after the publication of The Behavior of Organisms, published ten years after. Um, it was the application of the principles that I thought I had discovered to the design of a culture. But the, the reinforcing contingencies in the culture are all natural. In fact, there's a very strong trend against contrived ones. You don't ever say thank you in Walden II. That's a contrived reinforcer, you see. And that was true with my children. I never had a token economy. I never had a 
gold star point system, anything of that sort. The only exception of the, of my younger daughter, Deborah, I did twice shape a bit of behavior through the use of a reinforcer. Uh, once when she was about seven or eight months old, I was sitting in the living room holding her on my lap and playing with her and having fun. The room was getting dark and I reached up and turned on a lamp and uh, she smiled and I thought, ah, a reinforcer. So uh, I thought I would just see if I could use it. So I turned the light off and I waited for her until she lifted her left hand a little bit and I turned the light on immediately and then turned it off and she lifted it again. <laughs> Pretty soon she was, she was doing this to make the light go on. And uh, a few years later, a, a man named Fuller did the same thing with a 20-year-old vegetative idiot in the hospital, uh, found that this, this creature had never shown any sign of intelligence for 20 years, but by using the bottle that it ate from in the same way, got this vegetative idiot to do the same thing. So my daughter at least contributed to the uh, improvement in the, in the lives of vegetative uh, idiots. Anyway, uh, <laughs> when, she was, when she was four or five years old, I was telling her a bedtime story uh, rubbing her back. I was sitting on the edge of her bed for rubbing her back. And I, I thought, well, this is reinforcing. I'll see what I can do with this. So uh, I waited until she lifted a foot, and I rubbed her back, and I stopped. Lifted a foot again, and I rubbed her back. Then she gave a great kick and started to laugh. I said, what are you laughing at? She said, when I lift my foot, you rub my back. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, uh, she, she had advanced from the animal to the human stage by that time. <laughs> she, she could talk about the contingencies of reinforcement and, uh, and did. And both my, both my daughters would say to me, don't use your psychology on us. <laughs> and um, and I, never, uh, I never actually did. So they turned out well for perhaps the wrong reasons. <laughs> um, um, let me see, there are some very, very good questions here. I haven't organized them in any... Um, there's one question here about why is it that almost every therapeutic approach, regardless of theoretical orientation, seems to produce some success. This is one of the frustrating things, I think, about theories of psychotherapy. If, if you're really enthusiastic, it doesn't much matter, if, especially if it's your own theory. That's the main thing. It, it works. And, uh, uh, and this isn't misrepresentation. It's not cheating. Uh, I think uh, a patient who has the good luck to fall into the hands of someone who's just discovered a new theory of psychotherapy is a very lucky patient, because you'll get all kinds of very warm attention and so on. Now, I don't know. I haven't. I. I can't analyze and try to find the invariance in such a situation. But it would certainly have something to do with the heightened personal attention that a person gives to, to the therapist gives to a patient when a theory is at, uh, is at issue. And I, I suspect that that is it. That uh, what the actual reinforcers are that are that are that are operating. I I would hesitate to uh, to guess. 